Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. Okay, in this video what we're going to discuss is the concept of a coset. Okay, so we're going to discuss cosets. And we're also going to then discuss a really important theorem in group theory, which is called the Grange's Theorem. Okay, so our study of what cosets are will lead us on to uh, understanding the Grange's Theorem. Okay, so this video is entitled Cosets and the Grange's Theorem. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll start off with a discussion of cosets then. But before we move on to our discussion of cosets, let me remind you of a really important property of the composition tables of groups, which we first saw in a previous video in this playlist on group theory. Specifically, we saw it in the video on Cayley's theorem. Okay, so uh, let me just draw out a group then. So we'll have an arbitrary group, capital G here, which we know is a set of symbols. So here is the set, okay, with a composition law defined on it. Okay, so you can compose together any two elements of the set, okay, and the answer is in this composition table. So if you want to take, uh, for instance, an arbitrary element of the group little x and compose it with another arbitrary uh, element of the group little y, what that means in terms of the composition table is find the row that is dedicated to little x, okay, so every element of the group will have a row dedicated to it, let's say this is the row dedicated to this element little x, and then find the column that is dedicated to little y here, let's say this one over here is the column dedicated to little y, and take that entry there, and that will be the answer little x composed with little y. Okay, so for all possible compositions, uh, you'll have an entry in this composition table which will tell you what the answer to that composition actually is. Okay, so that then is um, a, a picture of a group. Okay, now the really important property of the composition table of groups that I want to remind you of is that actually all the rows of the composition table of the group and all the columns of a composition table of a group actually contain every element of the group once and only once. Now there's a fancy way of writing that, okay? Uh, so the fancy way of writing it is like so, and I'll just explain this, so bear with it for the time and I'll explain it now. Okay, so what we can do is we can pick an arbitrary element of the group, let's say a little a, okay? So you pick an arbitrary element of the group now, this arbitrary element of the group will have both a row corresponding to it and a column corresponding to it. This here is going to represent the row corresponding to it, or rather, all the elements in the row corresponding to it. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Well, this is the set of all things of the form little a, okay, composed with little g, where little g is an element of uh, the group capital G. Okay, so what this means then is it is the set where you have gone through all the elements of the group capital G and you have said what are these elements left multiplied by the element little a, okay, take all of the answers to those compositions and stick them in a great big set, that is what is meant by this uh, set a, little a uh, with the capital G written next to it. So in terms of the composition table, what does that actually mean? Okay, so once again, here is the composition table. Here is little a. Okay, so little a will have a row in the composition table dedicated to it. And basically, you are going through all of the elements of the group, all of the elements of capital G here, and you are saying, what is all of these elements of the group left multiplied by a? Now, hopefully, you can see that that is just all of the answers in this row, basically. This set is just all of the answers in this row, because all we are doing is going through all of the elements of the group, capital G, okay, which all have a column dedicated to them, and left multiplying them by this element, little a, and we're going to get all of the answers in this row here. So this set actually just consists of all the answers in this row in a great big set together, basically. Okay, so that's a fancy way of saying the all of the elements in the row uh, corresponding to little a. Similarly, uh, we can write all of the elements in the column dedicated to little a, like so, big G and then little a on the right this time, and this 
will mean the set of all things of the form little g composed with a on the right now, so uh, little g right multiplied by little a, okay, where little g is an element of capital G. So basically you let little g vary over all of the elements of the group capital G, and you right multiply all of these elements of the group by little a, okay, get all of the answers, stick them into this great big set here, okay, collect them all together in this set, and that will uh, then be this set capital G little a there. Now, once again, in terms of the composition table, what does this mean? Well, this time we are right multiplying all of the elements of the group by little a. So what we're going to be looking at is actually the column dedicated to the element little a. So we go through all of the elements of the group, and all of the elements of the group will have a row dedicated to them, and we're now going to right multiply them by this element little a here. Okay, so hopefully what you can see is that we will just get all of the elements in this column dedicated to little a. Because as we vary little g over all the elements of the group, we're just going through all of these rows, basically, and saying let's write multiply by a, so we're just taking all of the answers in that column. So this, then, is the name for the set of all the elements in that column corresponding to little a. Okay, now basically it is a fact about groups that all of the rows and all of the columns contain every element of the group. So these sets are in fact equal to the set of the group here. So they are in fact equal to this set here. You will get every possible element of the group appearing in these sets, basically, no matter what little a you pick. So let me just stress that. For all little a that you pick, so that means that you take any row in the composition table, or any column in the composition table, you will be able to find every element of the group at some point in that column or that row, basically. Okay, that is a property of groups. Now what is more, not only does every element appear once, but every element appears only once. Okay, so this is an additional property that you never have an element appearing more than once, okay? So every element of the group does appear in every single row and every single column, but no element of the group appears more than once uh, in any row or any column. So you don't have one element appearing twice in a certain row, okay? That's not allowed, okay? So it's a property of group composition laws. You can prove that if the composition law obeys the axioms of group theory, then it implies that all of the rows of the composition table and all of the columns of the composition table have every single element of the group appearing once and only once. Okay, and the proof is not difficult at all. It takes a bit of time, which is why I'm not going to go through it again. If you want to see the proof of it, uh, go back to my video on Cayley's theorem. and we prove it there, okay? Uh, but I just want to remind you of that fact, because we're going to make use of this later on in our discussion of cosets, okay? So, in a group composition table, then, all of the rows and all of the columns of that composition table contain every element of the group once and only once, okay? So that's one of the things that I want to refresh in your mind. Okay, the next thing that I want to refresh in your mind before we go on to the concept of cosets is the concept of a subgroup. Okay, so now let's say that we have capital H, which is a subgroup of our group capital G. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of what that actually means. So, a subgroup, first and foremost, is a subset of the elements of the group. Okay, so it's a subset of the elements of the group, so I'll draw it like so. So it's a sub-collection of the symbols that you have in this set, basically. Okay, so here, this is representing our subset, which is going to uh, be our subgroup. So first and foremost, any subgroup is a subset of the set that underlies the group. Now, of course, it's got to be more than just a subset, okay? What has to happen is this subset, capital H, with the inherited composition law on it from the composition law that you have on the larger group, capital G, has to be a group in its own right. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me just draw out the composition 
table of the larger group capital G again. So once again, here is our composition table. Now, all of the elements of capital G will be given a column, and all of the elements of capital G will be given a row. So that means that all of the elements of this subset, capital H, will be given a row and will be given a column. So let's just cluster all of the elements of this subset together. Okay, so let's say that this little portion of the composition table, or these rows of the composition table here, correspond to the elements that are in the subset capital H. Okay, so we've clustered all the elements of capital H together up here, and we've moved all the elements that aren't in capital H, but are in G, down here, basically. Okay, and let's do the same for the columns. Let's cluster together all the elements of H so that the columns that are dedicated to them are all together here. Okay, so here are all the elements of capital H, and then the rest of the elements of capital G are over here. Okay, now what we have here is a little sub part, okay, a little subsection of the composition table here which relates to composition of any two elements in capital H. So if you want to compose any two elements together in this subset capital H, you don't actually need all the information from this portion of the composition table on G. You don't need that. All you need is the information from this portion that I have now highlighted up in red here. Okay, so this is the composition table restricted to the subset, basically. Okay, and in order for this subset, capital H, to be a subgroup, the set of elements here, which is a set of elements, I know it's a subset, but it is a set in its own right. Okay, so this set of elements, capital H, with this composition law on it, in red here, the inherited composition law, or the induced composition law, as it's called, has to be a group. Okay, so if this set with this composition law and throw away the rest of the composition law, ignore all of the bit in blue, imagine that that's not there anymore, just focus on the bit in red, that needs to be a group in its own right. It needs to obey the axioms of group theory, closure, associativity, identity, and inverses. And if it does obey all of those, then it's called a subgroup. Okay, right, so those are the important things for us to understand before we now go into the discussion of cosets. Okay, right, uh, so I think we'll have a little break there, just mull over this stuff, and then in the next video we will start the discussion of cosets.